let's get straight to it. Uh, we were, I, I had, I, we're going to talk about Oppenheimer a lot. With, there's a few other very interesting things to talk about with our guest, Kai Bird. But um, Kai's suggestion, first of all, because it's always good to know something of the audience you're speaking to. This was his idea. Uh, is to work out how many of you have seen the movie Oppenheimer. So let's have a shot. Oh, there we are. Okay. Very good. So that gives you a sense, Kai, of who we're talking to. Amazing. So I mean, let's, begin, let's begin with that, that question of the film. It is so often the case, especially with people who write 722-page, historically rich biographies, that when the movie version comes out, they're disappointed because they couldn't possibly convey all the richness and detail that you'd gathered. How do you feel about this movie? I was blown away. It's a miracle. I really enjoyed seeing the movie. I enjoyed reading the script when it was shown to me initially. And uh, it's a miracle. It's a brilliant piece of art, cinematically. And yet, for the author, the biographer, he, Christopher Nolan has written something and filmed something that is historically largely accurate. It's very unusual for Hollywood to do this. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, no, and it, it isn't just the history that's all there, but in some ways the arguments, the concerns of your book are front and centre uh, in the film. Let, let, I mean, you wrote the book. I'm, I'm not sure how many people know this, that the book actually was published 18 years ago. So Hollywood reacting very swiftly, as always. Um, it was written 18 years ago. Here we are, two decades after you wrote it. Your co-author... Marty Sherwin began work on it, I think, in 1980. There, so this has been, you know, f 40 years in the making plus. How come J. Robert Oppenheimer is of such enduring interest that even 44 years, actually, after work started on this book, everyone is going to see the movie. We're, the book is selling in huge numbers. How come? Well, <clears throat> yes, Marty started it, my co-author, who, alas, sadly, is no longer with us. He died in October of 21, just two weeks after learning that Christopher Nolan was going to make the movie. Uh, Marty had started in 1980. Uh, he labored away for two decades, and then he came to me. We were friends, and he asked me to join him on this, this very rich project. And uh, initially, I said no, and uh, he persisted. <laughs> Actually, at one point said, if you don't join me, my gravestone is going to read, he took it with him. <laughs> so I joined him. And, uh, it's and why a, did he want a, a, a co-author at that he, point? He had gotten biographer's disease, which is when you can't start writing because you as the biographer are so obsessed that you know there's always one more interview to be done and one more archive to visit. <laughs> and he understood that Oppenheimer's life story was so important, so relevant. You know, when the movie came out, I saw Christopher Nolan repeatedly uh, quoted as saying that Robert Oppenheimer was the most uh, important man who ever lived. And I thought, well, wait a minute. Let me think about that. <laughs> Is that an exaggeration? Well, what he means is that Oppenheimer gave us the nuclear age, the atomic age that we are still living with, that we will always be living with in a, this very dangerous world, you know, balanced on the precipice of Armageddon. And so he's important in that way. And his story is just an incredibly complicated, he's a, he's a very vivid personality, this quantum physicist who also loves the Gita and learns Sanskrit so that he can read it in the original. He loves T.S. Eliot's poetry. You know, he's a polymath, and that's precisely why he's such a good scientist. But finally, the Oppenheimer story is so important and relevant today, not only because of the atomic bomb, because we're still living, we're still fighting wars, and there, there is a possibility that nukes could be used again, but his life story is interesting because it has an arc. He was triumphant in 1945, hailed as America's most famous scientist, and then nine years later, he is destroyed and humiliated in this secret kangaroo court at the height of the McCarthy era. And 
that story is really important to understand American politics to this day. It explains the phenomena of Donald Trump. Trump's politics have their seeds in McCarthyism, I would argue. And in fact, there's a person in common. I think <laughs> when you talk about that, they even have Roy Cohn is the figure in common. But let's just talk about this point about the atomic age, that we're still living in it, you said. Uh, you know, certainly for somebody like me, who's sort of you know, teenage years in the 1980s, we felt in the shadow of the nuclear bomb all the time, every conflict, there would be that fear that the, someone was going to press the button. People don't talk about it quite as much anymore. Do you think we've somehow lost sight of that nuclear threat hanging over us that we had front and center in the height of the Cold War? Yes, we've become far too complacent in living with the bomb. Uh, you know, Oppenheimer created this weapon of mass destruction. And then three months later, people forget, but he went on the road giving speeches in America, saying things like, you may think that this weapon was expensive because we, built, we spent $2 billion on it. Well, actually, it's cheap. And there are no secrets to building it. And it is a weapon of, uh, of, of, uh, for aggressors and a weapon of terror, and a weapon that was used on an already essentially defeated enemy. Now, you know, he also predicted that any country anywhere in the world that wanted to acquire these weapons, however poor, would be able to do so. So he, in 1945, he was predicting North Korea, and Israel, and Pakistan, and here in India, and uh, France, and maybe tomorrow Iran. And he was also warning, in a very prophetic way, I fear, about the dangers of a dirty bomb, of uh, uh, non-state actors, a terror group acquiring one of these weapons and using it on a city. Just, just on this point you've brought out there, the, the difference uh, uh, in his position, this in a way is the kind of dilemma or, or sort of moral conundrum that's at the heart of the book and actually also the film. And it's hard for people to understand. I'd like you to give us your take on it. On the one hand, you show us that he, there are people, even in 1945, while the war is still going on, who are saying, don't use this weapon. There's a petition. He's urged to sign it. And he says, we see, he, in June the 16th, 1945, we see no acceptable alternative to direct military use. That's his position. We've got to use it. Then... Afterwards, he becomes, as you've just said, this opponent of it. How do you square that circle? Why didn't he say, no, we should not use it, given all the fears he would articulate later? What, what, how do we explain both positions? Yeah, well, he's a very complicated man, and, and he understands hard truths. So he became convinced that the weapon had to be used in combat, and if it wasn't in this war, Humanity would not understand how, what a special, different weapon it was. Uh, so even in the spring of 1945, before the Trinity test, four months before Hiroshima, there's a mini revolt of his scientists at Los Alamos. And they're asking themselves, why are we working so hard to build this weapon when we know Germany has been defeated? Hitler is dead. And that was their main motivation. They feared that the Germans would get it first and that fascism would win the war with the atomic bomb. So up, they held a meeting, a, a public meeting in this secret city in Los Alamos. Oppenheimer allowed it to happen. He stood at the back of the room and uh, let everyone argue. And then he stepped forward and he said, I want to remind you what Niels Bohr, the famous Danish physicist, the father of the quantum, said to me when he arrived in Los Alamos on the last day of 1943. He asked me, Robert, I have one question for you. Is it big enough? Is it big enough to end all war? And so he had this notion that this was, you know, one weapon that could be dropped on and destroy a whole city and that this would you know, people had to understand in this war that it, we could never fight total warfare like that ever again because it would be Armageddon. So it's, a, it's an interesting rationalization, 
And at the same time, you know, he's, he has an ego, he's human, he wants this thing to succeed that he's been working on for two and a half years. It's the gadget, he wants to see it explode in the desert of Trin at, at, in New Mexico. But, but he could absolutely get that point about ego, but that surely would have been satisfied just by the Trinity test right. in the desert. Instead, he pushes for it to be used uh, in war and in uh, k killing tens of thousands of people in order to teach a lesson to the world. Yeah. Is that the case that he's saying all those people in Hiroshima and Nagasaki had to die in order to teach the world never to use nuclear weapons? Yeah, that's the terrible argument. And it's a, uh, it, part of me thinks it's the rationalization that uh, allowed to him to convince himself to go forward. But let me tell you one story that I learned. I, I discovered at one point when we were writing the book uh, that Oppenheimer's last secretary at Los Alamos was still alive and was living just a mile away from me in Washington, D.C. Her name was Ann Wilson. And I went to interview her, and she told me a story about walking to work with Oppenheimer one day in uh, July of 45 after the Trinity test. And suddenly she, she hears Oppenheimer muttering to himself, those poor little people, those poor little people. And she stops and says, Robert, what are you talking about? And he explains, well, the gadget we now know works at Trinity. It was a success. And now it's going to be used. And most of the victims are going to be women and children and poor little people. I, I went back and told Marty Sherwin, my co-author, this story, and he immediately said, well, that's very interesting because that's the same week that Oppenheimer was briefing the bombardiers who are going to be on the Enola Gay and drop that first weapon, and he was instructing them at what altitude it should be released and ignited to have the most maximum uh, effect, killing power. So this is a very complicated guy who, who can feel the tragedy, and yet he's feeling like he has to do his duty to see the, the, see the end of the story as such. Just on the point about the explosion and going back to the film, one of the few l criticisms I've picked up about the film is that it doesn't really show. The Im it sort of hints at it um, cinematically, but it doesn't really show in his words, the poor little people. It doesn't show the lives of, the, the, the human consequences. Do you think the film should have shown that? No. <laughs> and I, uh, I think so because if, if Nolan had stopped the movie in its tracks as such, you know, the whole movie is sort of shown from the point of view of Oppenheimer's eyes. His, from his point of view and then what happens to him in the trial. Um, if he had stopped and, and shown some old clips of some documentary of, you know, the destroyed Hiroshima, uh, it would, I think, be trite and uh, cinematically uninteresting. Instead, he substituted, uh, I think, a much more effective uh, scene where he has Oppenheimer sitting in a... Uh, uh, screening a documentary of uh, seeing the pictures himself. But you don't see the pictures. You see, though, Oppenheimer's emotional reaction to that. And that forces, the, I think, the audience to begin to imagine for themselves what it was like. And then there's another scene where he's giving a victory speech and then suddenly he hallucinates and sees a young woman's face melting. And uh, so, it's, again, it's his, it, you're seeing him struggle with the consequences of his actions in, in, his own, um, in his own mind. And I think that's very powerful cinematically. Let's just pick up a couple of the things you said in your uh, opening remarks about him. One of them is that he's, I mean, he is such a fascinating individual figure. And this polymath who's a, a brilliant physicist, but he masters languages, he reads poetry. What difference did that make? On, 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 for him as a scientist? Was he a better scientist because he could quote in Sanskrit and he could uh, 
uh, uh, you know, write and, and read and write poetry and so on. <laughs> what was the impact on him as a scientist? Uh, yes, I, I would answer yes. He was a better scientist because he was a better human being and a polymath and interested in the human condition and interested in poetry and stories. And I s argue that because, you know, in quantum, uh, Oppenheimer was never, was never very good at math. He failed at, in Cambridge as an experimental physicist. He was just clumsy with his hands as an experimentalist. That's not what, that, that wasn't his, his virtue. But when he discovered quantum physics in the 1920s, he could, as the movie says, he could hear the music of this science that explains the small world. And he had the imagination to ask the right questions. So in 1939, he sits down with a graduate student of his at Berkeley and writes a very short paper predicting the uh, existence of black holes. Now this is at a time when we don't have X-ray uh, telescopes. We can't see anything out there in the universe that, that would indicate a black hole, but he can imagine it. So it made him a very brilliant scientist, precisely because he was a humanist. And, and actually, this is where I thought, wow, Christopher Nolan really was the right person for this subject, because there are these um, you know, beautiful sort of interstellar-like imaginings at the beginning of the film, which plays to, to that sort of poetic... He's interested in time and space yes. and memory and yeah, science uh, fiction. And it, it was a very good fit. Um, but, but also this... Um, the Niels Bohr question, Kenneth Branagh in the movie. And he says, <clears throat> as you quoted, is it big enough to end a war? And I wondered what we as an audience are meant to make of that. Because on the one hand, there has not been another use in war of the nuclear weapon. On the other hand, obviously it didn't end all war. Wars are raging right now as we speak. And it ha they have done all through the eight years. I mean, do we credit Oppenheimer's invention uh, with there being no third world war? Or do we say it didn't work because pe pe humans have continued to fight each other for 80 years since? Well, it's, it's an unknown. We don't really know. We have survived 75 plus years since Hiroshima, but that's a drop in time in the, the great ocean of time. Uh, and Oppenheimer understood that Actually, if you know his his, uh, he really fervently believed that after World War II, after Hiroshima, we now had we we ha we should be able to understand the terrible nature of this weapon, and therefore should, we should take steps to control it. To uh, in, he wanted he proposed creating an international atomic authority that would have sovereign rights to go to any laboratory, any factory, and inspect it anywhere in the world. Was he, wanted to realistic, do you think? he wanted to ban the bomb. Uh, I think it is realistic, and I think it is the only hope we have for surviving the atomic age in the long term. Otherwise, it's going to be, it's going to be used by someone. I mean, Vladimir Putin is, is, has been threatening to use tactical nuclear weapons on the battlefields of Ukraine. Um, and I fear the, this Middle East war, the hatred and the anger is so deep that someone, a non-state actor, could acquire a dirty bomb or pieces of uh, uh, a weapon and put it together and, and use it as a weapon of terror, which is the only purpose. There, it is not a military weapon. <laughs> so I, I know it sounds naive. I'm always being con <laughs> accused of being naive, but I think some kind of regime to control this technology is necessary. And you know, this is also uh, a lesson for us. We're on a new, on the verge of a new scientific revolution with artificial intelligence. And again, we need s smart scientists who know how to talk to us in plain language about the choices we face with this new technology in the same way that Oppenheimer was trying to teach us how to deal with the bomb. Uh, well, I, exactly what I was going to ask you about, about AI, and what lessons you think, or what message scientists who are now working on AI, which some people think d does pose an existential risk. 
the idea that it, you know that artificial intelligence could develop so-called um, artificial general intelligence, where it suddenly makes you know decisions for itself and could decide decisions that are good for it and bad for us. Uh, that's the risk. Um, what, what, if, if people wanted to be true to the lessons of Oppenheimer's story, scientists who are working on it, what would they do with AI? Would they stop the work? Because they've seen that, as Oppenheimer learned, once you've invented this thing, you can't control, you can't put the genie back in the bottle. What lessons should they learn? Yeah, Oppenheimer always said that you can't stop science. You can't stop human beings from trying to figure out the physical world around them. Uh, but you can try to learn from the science and you, tr you can make choices on how to use this technology. So he wanted to ban uh, nuclear weapons but use nuclear energy. And Sam Altman, one of the creators of artificial intelligence, is saying, you know, we need to stop and, and not go too fast with this. We need, it's another Oppenheimer moment. He actually uses that phrase. Um, and so I think, for instance, you know, with artificial intelligence, we need to very quickly have firm rules about privacy uh, uh, and ban the use of taking my information and, and using it in, with, with these machines uh, indiscriminately. Uh, and there are many other questions that are, we're facing, but I think we need to find a way to regulate it and humanize it and make sure that if it's going to take jobs away from truck drivers, we need to do this slowly and gradually and find a way to retrain the truck drivers to do something else. I mean, there, it, there's a lot of social engineering that's going to have to be done. And, and maybe Sam Altman should be able to explain and speak out as a public intellectual to, to show us what the choices are. But unfortunately, because of what happened under, uh, to Oppenheimer in 1954, when he was silenced and destroyed, that sent a message to generations of scientists to beware to get out of your small lane, beware of becoming a public intellectual, talking about policy or politics, because you could be destroyed. You, they could use your, you know, the politicians could turn your expertise on you and uh, destroy you for, accuse you of being disloyal or unpatriotic or, um, and so that's, that's very unfortunate, I think. And one of the things that comes through in your story, um, both book and film, is that until that moment, scientists really were looked upon in the way that kind of writers or other people are as uh, sort of seers and prophets for society. And that Oppenheim was there on the cover of Time magazine and Life magazine, and people wanted to know what he thought about everything. Exactly. And then af but after his humiliation uh, in 1954, um, as you just said, he went, not only he went quiet, as it were, but science went quiet. Um, just in that period where, it, or, or even before he's sort of uh, taken down, there's a scene, it's in, it's in the book and the film, where he meets Truman. And, you know, in the film it's done very well, where he becomes sort of stumbling and inarticulate. But he's unhappy. And, you know, we have Truman saying, never let me meet that crybaby again. I don't want to have to see him again. What I w w was wondering was, what exactly did Oppenheimer really want Harry Truman to do with this terrible knowledge that he'd given him. Uh, I mean, the, the international regime, you're imagining, I know you said it's naive, but maybe it's the only way. I, he was, was he really asking an American president to sort of surrender his power and hand over this invention, what, to a group of scientists? I mean, what did, what, what did Oppenheimer want with this thing he'd invented? Yeah, he was desperate. This was his one chance to convince the president of the United States, Harry Truman, to... Uh, understand that there are no secrets, that anyone could build it, and therefore it's a, it's a weapon that can be used against us. It's a threat against America. So don't build more of these. Instead, convene a, a, an international conference, ban the weapons, uh, and use the science for good. And so, it, you know, it was very politically naive. It was not going to happen. <laughs> Harry Truman did not understand. He thought that, that 
Only Americans could control this weapon and, and invent it. He interrupts Oppenheimer and says, well, you know, when do you think the Russians are going to get it? And, and then interrupts him again and says, well, the Russians can never get it, says Harry Truman, because they're not capable of it. Well, this is, you know, at that moment, Oppenheimer understood the president of the United States just does not understand that there are no secrets that the Russian physicists can do this just as well as American. Uh, yeah. No, I, it is political naive, but uh, again, you know, we do have an international atomic energy agency. It does go around the world and try to inspect places. I think we need to double down on that. We need to try to convince Iran tomorrow not to build this weapon. We need to convince Israel to dismantle their own nuclear weapons. We have to give up ours. They're useless. But again, politically, uh, I'd be the first to admit that this isn't going to happen tomorrow. Yeah. I, I mean, and uh, in your AI example, artificial intelligence, the worry would be that people would come away thinking, well, th th you know, they were naive to think it could be controlled. And similarly, we'd be naive to think that AI could be controlled because there will always be the equivalent of like a North Korea, a country that says, OK, those are the rules. We're going to break them. Let's um, just, because we'll take questions very soon, but just before we do, I want to ask you about a couple of other bits of your work, because obviously Oppenheimer is one very important book, but you've written on lots of other things. Uh, and you've mentioned a couple of times the Middle East, and you wrote, published a book, I think in 2010, um, Crossing Mandelbaum Gate, in which you re re describe your own really quite unusual upbringing that, and, and life's sort of story, which means you see this in a way from both sides, partly to do with how you grew up and where you grew up, but also to do with the woman you married and the, and the, and the family you married into. So you explain how you see this from two sides. Yes, I had a very weird childhood. <laughs> I, I grew up in the Middle East. My first memories as a child are of East Jerusalem, the Arab section of Jerusalem and Israel. Um, but I also lived in Beirut and Saudi Arabia and Cairo. And I grew up, you know, sympathetic to the Palestinian plight. And uh, then as, as a young man, I, I met and married uh, Susan, who is not only Jewish, but is the only daughter of two Holocaust survivors. Um, and uh, so I, in my Crossing Mandelbaum Gate, my childhood memoir, I tell both stories my, uh, and, and weave it in with a lot of history about the Arab-Israeli conflict. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a memoir, but it's like biography, which I argue is the sort of best vehicle for conveying history because it's so accessible. It's a story about one person's life. And, and then along the way, you learn a lot of history. Likewise, with memoir, you can convey, that was my aim at least, was to try to convey the complexity of this terrible conflict. And you said, that you wrote actually at the time, there are two peoples who are filled with victimhood and they don't understand each other's victimhood. And I thought those words had an extra resonance in 2024 or at least, uh, you know, after the autumn of 2023, even than they did in 2010. What, just unpack for us what you're saying there. Yeah, well, I think in your session yesterday, you were talking uh, about the, the, the traumatization of the Jewish people because of what happened during the Holocaust. Uh, you know, it, it affected my wife because she, she heard stories from her parents about what happened to them. But it's a, a, a affected the whole Jewish community. It's, and, you know, they say never again. And this, un, unfortunately, they cannot see actually at times what is happening on the other side. Uh, so when I was growing up in East Jerusalem, uh, Mandelbaum Gate was the one checkpoint back and forth where diplomats only could, could travel. So I could see both sides as a little boy. <laughs> and uh, I actually, in that book, I tell the story that my parents told me. I was five, six years old. Apparently, we were at the American Colony, a, a very uh, boutique, lovely hotel in East Jerusalem. 
And at the next table was a, a, a wealthy uh, American woman who announced that she would give a million dollars to anyone who could solve this uh, Arab-Israeli conflict. And apparently I grabbed my father's cuffs and I said, Daddy, Daddy, we have to win that prize. <laughs> so, and I think ever since I've been trying to win that prize, naively thinking that both sides should be able to talk to each other. Well, I mean, so, I mean in terms of na naivety, you have sort of leaned into that because you said at the time you were for a two-state solution when the book came out. I'm interested to know if you still are, but you said then at a time when the realists have all failed, we should be naive. We should go for a naive solution. Um, and it's funny, naivety is a theme here. With, with I guess with, it is a theme here. <laughs> yeah, with, with Oppenheimer, and in a way, funnily enough, even Truman naive about the science, about the, um, about the weapons. Uh, but what, what, what is the naive solution that you think even the little boy who was tugging his father's coat should be advocating even in the light of everything we've seen in recent months? Well, the short answer is I, I, I'm, I'm still in favor of a two-state solution. Uh, but it seems to be receding rapidly. Um, you know, my last book was on Jimmy Carter, uh, who was president in the 1970s for four, ter four years. And at Camp David, he achieved a peace between Israel and Egypt. But he also, at Camp David, he believed that he had uh, wrangled a promise from Menachem Begin, the Prime Minister of Israel, to have a freeze of settlements in the West Bank. And, of course, Begin didn't see it that way. He immediately announced that he was building more settlements. Uh, uh, and Carter spent the rest, you know, the next four decades warning that more Jewish settlements, Israeli settlements in the West Bank is going to be uh, create a, 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 an obstacle to a, a long-term peace with the Palestinians. And if you take over the West Bank, uh, then you're looking at a one-state solution. And that seems to be even more naive or <laughs> impractical. But, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I, un I understand that uh, it's really hard to see a two-state happening tomorrow. But again, I think it's the only rational, and if there were concerted international efforts to impose a peace in somehow, well, you'd have to get the Americans to do this. Yeah. And I don't see, you know, Joe Biden pressuring Israel in the way that Jimmy Carter tried and failed. Uh, it's, it, the politics are just very deadly. Questions in, in one second. The last thing I want to ask you about is Carter. He's the subject of your most recent book. You know, often used as a sort of byword in America for a failed president. I think your book argues that he's a much more substantial figure than he's uh, seen. He is just an extraordinary figure. He's now, I think, 99. Um, I, I, you know, I think it was mentioned there that I present for The Guardian a podcast on American politics called... Politics Weekly America, it was announced over a year ago that Jimmy Carter was going into hospice care. So like every other journalist well, in this subject, we prepared immediately an obituary program to be ready to go in days, we thought. It's, over, it's nearly 18 months later, and he's still alive. I mean, he is just in every way a, 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 just an, a sort of outlier, as you argue in his book. He stands apart from everyone else. Yes, the title of the book was The Outlier. And he is, you know, relentless. That, that word defines Jimmy Carter. He's, he was always very focused on, uh, as a politician on winning. And he was actually, people didn't understand this, but he could be ruthless at winning <laughs> in the campaign. Uh, you know, he, he was a peanut farmer from South Georgia came out of nowhere and won the White House in 1976. But he's a Southern Baptist who also believes that the worst sin in life is pride. <laughs> and he was a, a man who was full of pride and ambition. And the only way that he could uh, deal with this contradiction in his life is to argue with himself that, well, I need to achieve power to do good. 
and once I'm in the governor's mansion or once I'm in the White House, I will ignore the politics and I will do what I perceive to be the right thing. So this was his approach to Camp David, the only reason it happened. All his advisors told him, no, 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 this is impossible, it's a, it's a hornet's nest, don't go there. Jimmy Carter studied the issue and said, you know, the right thing to do is to bring peace to this region, have, he didn't talk about two states, but that's what he was heading towards. Yeah. And uh, he just plowed ahead and he's the only president who achieved anything in, in the way of steps towards the peace in the Middle East. And yet he's a prophet that has been ignored ever since. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. Um, is there a theme connecting these people? Jimmy Carter, Robert Oppenheimer, the other people you've worked on, it is quite a range. You're not, there are people who are presidential biographers who only write books about presidents. There are people who write books about scientists. You move between all these categories. What's the connecting thread between Kai Bird's subject? Well, I think you pointed out one word, naivete. <laughs> uh, but I'm also interested in power and specifically how power works in America in this democracy that's very complicated give and take. And so my first book was about a powerful Wall Street lawyer named John J. McCloy, who was sort of the grease in the wheels of democracy. He was, you know, in, he was assistant secretary of war, making the decision not to bomb Auschwitz, for instance, during World War II. But after the war, he was president of the World Bank, uh, high commissioner in occupied Germany. He re rebuilt West Germany putting Adenauer in power. Uh, you know, he, he had his fingers in everything, but always from behind the scenes, all the way up to Ronald Reagan's presidency. So I was, you know, fascinated by that. Likewise, I chose to write about McGeorge Bundy, only because, you know, he's not a household name, but he was a national security advisor to Kennedy and Johnson. And he was one of the major architects of the war in Vietnam which when I was a young man, I thought made him a war criminal. <laughs> so I wanted to understand how he, a liberal former dean of Harvard University, an intellectual, could have gotten us into this terrible war. Um, so I, I'm interested in how power works. And uh, you know, that's, that's true also of, you know, I, I wrote about the Middle East and two books, Crossing Mandelbaum Gate, but also a book called The Good Spy, which is a biography of a clandestine CIA officer um, and, who was killed in Beirut in 1983. And I wanted to understand uh, how power, US foreign policy works in the Middle East. And, and so I, I go after what is, you know, gives me fire in the belly. <laughs> yeah. um. Well, thank you for, so, so much for that. There's a huge, huge amount of ground we've already covered, but there will be questions. So let's take some questions from all of you. Um, why don't we go to the man who got his hand up, I think, first, and then we'll take more. Yeah. Uh, just wanted to draw your attention to what just is... Just bring it a little closer to your mind. I just wanted to draw your attention to perhaps an obscure book written by a British historian called Peter Watson. It's called A Terrible Beauty ideas and thoughts that change the modern world, the title perhaps taken from William Butler Yeats's poem, Easter, A Terrible Beauty is Born. Peter Watson says that the years 1900 to 2000 have been the most destructive years in the history of humanity. We are already 24 years into the new century. I was just wondering uh, if, if a book were to be written now, considering that Ukraine has happened, you know, Gaza is happening, what would that story be like if you were to write a futuristic book? So, so the, the question is that the, the one writer thought that the years 1900 to 2000 have been the most destructive in the history of humanity. Given what's happened in the last 24 years, how would you now begin to regard the period we're living in now in terms of humanity? Yeah, it doesn't look good, does it? <laughs> no. Uh, the 20th century was extremely violent. Um, but it's also true that if you do a graph of the number of human beings killed in warfare over the last 
uh, 2,000 years, the graph, the numbers went up and up and up and, until finally in 1945 they began to go down. But we did, as you said, we had Korea, we had Vietnam, we had many wars in the Middle East that killed uh, many people, but not on that scale. Uh, and it's possible, again, I'm trying to be naively optimistic, but it's possible that maybe we will finally learn a lesson and turn the corner, but it doesn't look good. No, I think we can agree on that. Let's see some more hands. There's a lady there. Yeah, keep your hand up so that we can see you. Thank you, good morning. I have a question going back to Oppenheimer about lomanids. Um, I grew up in Socorro, New Mexico. Where uh, also, if you could bring the microphone a little Sorry. nearer. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. About lomanids. I grew up in Socorro, New Mexico, where lomanids ended up teaching physics at New Mexico Tech and graduated high school with his son, actually. And his portrayal in the film was somewhat two-dimensional. So I wonder about your thoughts on Lomanitz's role in the work they were doing, that revocation of his deferment, and or his relationship with Oppenheimer. Again, about Lomanitz. So is this, is, is this, could you just say the name of the yeah. character again slowly? Uh, Dr. Lomanitz, Lomanitz. The one in San Francisco who oh, got his draft, yes. of his military deferment deferred and got sent to the war. Yeah, yes, it's Lomanitz, one of the smaller yes. characters in the book and when you want to know about how he was depicted and, in the film. And he's depicted in the film too as this eager young sci uh, scientist studying with, under Oppenheimer. Uh, and, you know, he had, sadly, uh, after the war, he, because he had been a member of the Communist Party and active, he, he, was, um, he became another victim of the McCarthy period. And a sad story. Yeah. Um, let's, if, could you go to the gentleman there with the glasses on? Yeah, keep your hand up. There we are. That's it. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. So clearly, Robert was having inner conflict back then. Sorry, I'm asking this of everyone. If you could get it a little closer, there we are. Yeah, clearly, Robert was having inner conflict back then, and there was duality in his action. So how do you, as a writer, step into his brain and explore his thoughts for your, writer, uh, for your readers? And I, I missed the beginning, but the question was, how do you, as a writer, get into the thoughts of uh, the characters from history and explain them to your readers? Ah, well... You know, it's a treasure hunt in the archives, um, and that can be a lot of fun. You know, you're, as a biographer, you're, you're really, uh, you're writing like a novelist, trying to seek the truth, but you, um, unlike the novelist, you have footnotes. <laughs> you must have footnotes. <laughs> and uh, that means you've got to find sources either written documents, preferably diaries and letters written at the time, and uh, otherwise government memos. Uh, in the case of Oppenheimer, there were 7,000 pages of FBI documents, Federal Bureau of Investigation, uh, that had Oppenheimer under surveillance. And so you're creating a story from uh, sometimes oral histories, interviews, and documents, and it's a, it's a lot of fun. It's a treasure hunt that uh, is exciting at times and very arduous. <laughs> and you had this extraordinary thing of the transcript of that kangaroo court. I was surprised that given that it was all behind closed doors and it was uh, really a sort of um, an unfair trial, I was amazed they kept a transcript or that they even wanted it recorded. Ah, well... Uh, Louis Straws, who orchestrated the whole kangaroo court to bring down Oppenheimer to, in the words of Edward Teller, to defrock him in his own church, to destroy him as a public intellectual. Uh, they wanted to do this in secret uh, in the first instance so that Oppenheimer wouldn't ha have a stage. Wouldn't, and then they decided that the transcript was so embarrassing and damaging about his personal life and his politics, his uh, flirtation with the Communist Party in the 1930s, that in 1954, well, Straws arranged for the transcript to be leaked on purpose to the New York Times, knowing that this would, you know, sort of be the nail in the coffin, destroy Oppenheimer's reputation. And indeed, it did for a long time. You know, it, it was an outrage. It, it was perceived as an outrage by his colleagues at Los Alamos and, and uh, intellectuals like, actually, McGeorge Bundy, who was a friend of Oppenheimer's. Uh, but the 
the public at large just saw in this transcript uh, a discredited man, a man who had been uh, maybe a communist, maybe a spy, disloyal, untrustworthy, a philanderer, yes. not faithful to his wife. I mean, it was personally devastating. And Oppenheimer afterwards, and this is not in the movie depicted, but afterwards, he that summer of 1954, he retreats, he hides, he takes his family on a sailing trip in the Caribbean and discovers St. John and this lovely little island in the Virgin Islands and uh, buys a small piece of property right on the beach, builds a very Spartan cabin where he spends the rest of his life four or five months every year living like a beach bum, wandering the beaches and alone. And uh, it's a very sad story. Um, let's take some more. Let's go further back because I don't want to discriminate against people further back. Yes, the lady there's got a hand up. Keep your arm up. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Quick question. Why Prometheus? Ah, very good. Because I wanted to ask that too. The, I was going to do that at the end, but let's do it now. Why Prometheus is the question. Ah, well, <clears throat> Prometheus uh, was the Greek mythical god who... Uh, allegedly stole fire from Zeus and gave it to hu humankind and then was punished for it by Zeus and hung up on a, a cliff and a giant eagle would every night pick out his liver. Um, so it's a great metaphor for Oppenheimer's life, but I want to take this opportunity to say, uh, you know, our working title, Marty Sherwin and I, for years, our working title was simply Oppie which was his nickname. And uh, a few days before the book was going into production, we get a call from my editor saying, you know, the marketing people say they cannot sell a book with the title Oppie. <laughs> you have two days to come up with a new title. So that night, uh, as I was falling asleep, my wife Susan turned to me and said, why don't you call it Prometheus or American Prometheus? And I rolled over and said, nah, no, people don't remember their Greek gods anymore. That's too obscure. And I went to sleep. The very next morning, Marty Sherwin calls me, very excited, and says, I have a title. I went out to dinner last night with our mutual friend, another biographer, Ronald Steele, and he said, I would never read a, a book called uh, Oppie. Why don't you call it American Prometheus? Wow. <laughs> So I, I said, Marty, I'm in big trouble. I have to apologize to my wife. <laughs> and, you know, it is a, a, a terrific title because Prometheus, you know, what happened to Prometheus happened to Oppenheimer. And uh, the story of his downfall is really the important part of the story. So. And it gives it the kind of mythic grandeur which actually Oppie deserves. I, I think it's good you didn't call it Oppie. I think we can agree on that. Um, why don't we go to the gentleman there? He's been patient. There we are. I think we're going to have probably this and one more, and then we must finish. Yeah. yeah. Well, was Hitler's virulent anti-Semitism the crucial factor which prevented uh, Germany from getting the atom bomb before USA? Thank you. And if that had happened, would the fate of the world war have been reversed? Very good. So w the question is, was Hitler's virulent anti-Semitism the reason that Germans did not acquire an atomic bomb? And if they had, obviously, the war would have been very different. Yes, well, that's, that may be one factor that contributed to Germany losing the race to build the atomic bomb. Because he expelled all these uh, Jewish Germans, scientists, and many of them ended up in America helping Robert Oppenheimer to build the gadget. But there's also a very interesting debate among historians. Uh, some of you may remember the famous play Copenhagen that described this conversation between Niels Bohr and uh, Werner Heisenberg, the German physicist who led the bomb project in Germany. And historians are still arguing among themselves about whether Heisenberg failed because he made a simple mathematical error in calculating how much enriched uranium would be necessary, 
uh, or whether he was actually trying to sabotage the German project because he did not want Hitler to get the bomb. And it's a fascinating story and a sort of counter story to what Oppenheimer did. Thank you. This will be the very last question. Um, why don't we go there? The, yeah, the man in red with a hand up. Oh, she didn't. Yeah, that was who I had in mind. That's it. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, about the uh, you know, kangaroo, quote, kangaroo quote that Oppenheimer went through, right? Uh, do you think that he took all that beating lying down uh, because he thought that he deserved to be punished? Uh, or do you think that he actually understood that history would redeem him? Like with the testimony of Dr. David Hill in uh, okay. the confirmation hearing of Louis Strauss. Thank you. Fascinating question. Do you think in some ways Oppenheimer took his punishment lying down, the questioner says, in 1954, because on some level he thought he deserved to be punished? Yes, you know, the, the film actually suggests that uh, in a way uh, in this dialogue that Opp Oppenheimer has with his wife Kitty, who accuses him exactly of this. I don't know, Marty and I wrestled with, in the book, where you have a chance to be much more nuanced. Uh, you know, we wrestled with why was Oppenheimer so passive during the trial? He didn't defend himself aggressively. He uh, said idiotic things uh, that opened up the, the door for the prosecutor as such to, to nail him. And uh, we, we we think it's sort of, it, it's in that gray area of psychology. But he was a complicated man. He, you know, he never apologized for Hiroshima and Nagasaki. He said he never regretted what he had done. But he obviously was pained by the tragedy. He fell into a deep depression within days after Hiroshima, reading the accounts in the newspaper and realizing what he had done, what the human cost was. So he, he, he was pained, and uh, I, I don't know, I can't, I don't have a, a clear answer to that, but it's a great question. <laughs> it is a great question. Um, that is also our last question. I'm sure you're going to want to join with me in thanking our speaker, Kai Bird. <laughs>